Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar. We really look forward to talking through everything through COVID-19, local search, all the good stuff that's going on, not so fun stuff, but uh, definitely want to make sure that everybody has the chance to join uh, within this webinar. Um, just want to make sure that everybody knows uh, there is a Q&A section on the bottom uh, that allows you to actually, you know, push in uh, you know, questions, and then we'll answer that throughout the entire uh, kind of conversation and webinar material that we have today. Um, we're looking about, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, feel free to uh, jump in at any time. Everybody will be muted at this given time, but uh, we will answer as many questions as possible. So we have great panelists on, on the, the line today. Um, so let's just give everybody a few more minutes just to join uh, so that we have all the attendees. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, there might be a recording, but then also uh, white paper will be in there, but I'll go through more details here in a second. So as people join, um, I think we could get started now. Uh, just want to thank, once again, everybody for joining us. Uh, just to kick things off, we're going to do a dive into uh, kind of what local marketing looks like uh, from an SEO perspective, listing perspective, uh, but really around, you know, what does it look like for multi-location brands uh, as things are changing so fast. So we know there's a lot of uh, you know, kind of interruptions, uh, closures, uh, seeing a lot of uh, big brands kind of shutting down as well. But on top of that is, you know, just a few reminders for uh, this call before we get started is everybody will be muted um, other than the panelists on, on the screen today. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're going through and, and answering your questions throughout the webinar. So feel free to use that Q&A box the chat box, however you want. Uh, but then on top of that is, uh, you know, reaching out to us, you know, marketing at RioSEO.com. You can also follow, follow us on Twitter at RioSEO underscore SEO. Um, we have Facebook pages, LinkedIn pages. Uh, we're always here to help. And then uh, we're also releasing a white paper based on our conversation today. So a lot of today's topics, is making sure that, you know, look at our website. We have a COVID-19 uh, section within there, but then also look for more materials like the white papers, case studies, and anything like that that comes out um, on top of the conversation that we're going through with Crystal and Lauren today. So we will record this. Um, so if you have to hop off, have to jump to another meeting, have to handle kids, I understand that. Uh, definitely feel free and then uh, you would actually have, you know, a recording of this over the next uh, 24 hours and look for a, a follow-up from our team as well. So to get things started, I um, really want to introduce myself. So I'm Tyler Ludwig, uh, Director of Enterprise Solutions at Rio SEO. I've uh, been here for about uh, eight plus years now. I uh, really focus around every type of the product uh, from sales to marketing to product itself. Uh, and really in the local space, and I'm excited today to moderate uh, and really bring in two of the powerhouses that we have on our staff. So I love both of them. Um, obviously, we're all at home, but uh, I want to, you know, make sure that you know that Crystal Tang, she's our director of local listings, um, as well as local strategy at Rio SEO and Google My Business expert. So any questions that come in, she is your go-to for that for especially around Google My Business and listing management. And then on top of that is Lauren. So Lauren is a account director on our, on our team, uh, but an also a great SEO specialist. So if there's organic SEO questions, any questions that have 
for keyword research or, or anything like that that comes up throughout the conversation, definitely feel free to uh, do that as well. Um, so thank you both for joining us today. Really appreciate it. I know we're all at home and want to make sure that this is a great webinar for everybody at home. So to start it is uh, a big question is, I know there's a lot of things going on. Um, what would you say you're most excited about? I know it's not an exciting time, but excited to do once you get out of quarantine, right? I'm in California, I'm locked down, so is Crystal. Lauren's on, you know, a massive acre ranch, having a great time. But when it comes down to, uh, you know, after this quarantine and kind of virus somewhat levels off, what are, you know, kind of the two uh, things that you guys would like about, um, you know, moving forward? I'll start with Crystal. So I would have to say, I think one of my favorite things about the San Diego summer is like mm. listening to live music by the beach. So I'd really hope to sometime in the next couple of months, like catch a concert, you know, whether it's in Del Mar um, or, or down by the bay, but that's just like one of the greatest joys of being in San Diego. So I'm hoping that we'll get to do that again soon, obviously safely, but uh, that's one of the things I'm looking forward to. What about you, Lauren? I'm just excited to get ice cream for my favorite local creamery <laughs> <laughs> that's supposedly open, but nobody's, you know, doing the social distancing and all the regulations in New York that, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of try to self-regulate or regulate others. So I'm just excited to get ice cream and be able to eat it outside and around other people and <laughs> maybe go for a hike and not have to worry about not breathing when people pass you and stuff like that. So yeah simple okay. things okay yeah and, and trust me i just want to get away from two crazy kids but i love that <laughs> <laughs> so uh i love that so for today's agenda i really want to just go through you know some simple points um of really this is uh you know part series um that we've been going through but want to explore really which covid related trends are impacting brands and how your brands can uh, can prepare for this new normal, right? So we're all kind of sitting into kind of this uh, trend, especially within you know, shelter at home. Some states are opening up. Um, but what we want to you know, kind of look at is incorporating, you know, how do you incorporate online businesses uh, or business practices into your brick and mortar strategy? What does that look like? Is it buy online, pick up at the store? adjusting to dramatic changes in media consumption, right? People are uh, highly on video. So maybe TV uh, from a media perspective is coming in. Uh, but then also, you know, contact, contact less um, services like the pickup, buy online, uh, pick up curbside. Um, we've seen that with a lot of customers kind of transitioning away from, uh, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, Safeway or, you know, Vaughn's or Kroger model where buy online and then pick up your groceries at the outside of the store, which is becoming more common. On top of that is what do we do for, uh, you know, on, online ordering, but then also handling uh, temporary closures. What does that look like? And that's why, you know, Crystal is definitely here uh, for temporary closures. Do you use specialty hours? What does that look like? Um, how do we reopen stores at a particular case? Um, and then also post pandemic local marketing. What's that going to look like? So really to start off on that kind of first topic is, you know, what's the overall impact of COVID-19 on local businesses, stay at home orders, um, you know, had a direct impact on consumer behavior and, you know, how consumers were once hesitant uh, to try out online ordering. Now it's kind of become a reality. We kind of have to do that. There's, you know, unless you want to go into store with, a mask and gloves and everything like that, curbside pickup and delivery service are now really great, right? So we've seen that. So as some states start to reopen businesses, um, it's inevitable that consumers will still feel some apprehension going into a crowded store. I totally get that. Um, so Crystal, my question to you would be, you know, how can brands incorporate e-commerce and other online business practices into their brick and mortar strategy? 
So I would say one of the things that has been really successful um, from an e-commerce or online strategy perspective is leveraging your reporting and adjusting accordingly based on the actions that you see um, consumer behavior. And what we've seen and a lot of our brands and agency partners have seen uh, you know, in the last two, three months is that digital is really at the forefront of driving a lot of these conversations and changes. And I don't think that's going to change in the next six months, nine months, 12 months. Um, I think leveraging your digital reporting tools, seeing what users are interacting with on your listing, on your locator pages, are they calling you? Does that mean you need to adjust your um, the, the way that you're funneling your phone calls? Are they looking more for store information? Um, those types of things. But I think really leveraging your local reporting from a digital standpoint um, and sharing that with your, you know, retail teams or your in-store teams, or if you're, you know, a service provider, um, sharing the way that you've historically used that from a digital perspective with those teams, I think has been really, really powerful. Okay. And I would ask on that topic too, is, is Lauren, you're the you know, kind of SEO guru over here. Um, you know, what does that look like from, you know, how do you measure online to offline, uh, you know, when it comes to local or is there any new practices that you've seen? So, I mean, it's, it's a really great question. And I think some businesses are trying to figure out what that look looks like because attribution models have changed significantly alone, right? Without a global pandemic in the past few years, um, as e-commerce becomes a large chunk or a large opportunity for brands to really clearly state, um, effort to dollars. Um, I think at this time, it's really reevaluating the basics and fundamentals where if there weren't tracking parameters before making sure that things are tracked appropriately and reevaluating and re-auditing the pages anything that is driving potential revenue um, to see what's happening from there if there were additional phone calls right things like that and then what we do is we still do the estimated roi model based on how frequently you know provided from google how frequently a search leads to an in-store purchase, right? So really being more nimble in terms of average order values and conversion rates and, and not sticking to the standards and really just trying to play with those and really, you know, stating its estimations. Um, you know, that's what we've been focused on, but I've, you know, been working with some clients and just kind of stepping back to ensure things are tracked uh, so that they can consistently see the journey point um, for the last touch, right, attribution um, to make sure that they can correlate online to offline. I think that businesses are trying to understand a little bit more how to, uh, how curbside, right, and that whole piece is uh, occurring. Um, you know, is that changing average order values? Is that changing how much revenue we are going to be able to bring in because you still have the overhead of stores, but you have to have, you know, you have less employees that are required, things like that. So, you know, those are a lot of elements businesses are, are reevaluating and I think they are going to for the next year at a minimum. Um, but other than that, a lot of the fundamentals still remain the same. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and I think just to you know, kind of key off on that one, it's kind of the second topic is, you know, contact free services, right? So, um, yeah, I know, you know, Burger King is doing, you know, you bring it out on Platter, same as Panera, um, but also drop off uh, delivery service as well. So as people kind of look at that, um, understanding that, you know, Google adds new attributes to new categories um, or, you know, just functionality within the GMB listings themselves um, for curbside or, or delivery. My question to uh, Crystal would be, you know, now that some stores can reopen, some are not open, uh, depending on the state, um, should brands continue to offer these sorts of contact-free services, even if it is a um, open state in that particular uh, category? And then what updates, if any, should brands make to accommodate the post-COVID way of shopping? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think, I mean, we've seen numbers of reports saying that there may be another, you know, wave of this in the fall or the winter time. So I think um, not only are do brands need to be ready to adjust and pivot again, you know, in, in three to six months, hopefully not as drastically, 
um, but I also think they have a responsibility to to lead the way. So um, certainly, I think if they're offering contact free services um, or curbside pickup and, and delivery like that, they they should continue exploring this for you know um, a longer period than just you know COVID nineteen and and what this looks like right now. But I would definitely suggest to any brands or businesses offering this, um, you know, survey your clients, look at your reviews, see how they feel about the services that you're offering. Um, is there an opportunity to adjust or improve those services? I know that like I've ordered pizza delivery and chose the contact free delivery where, you know, they should just leave it at my door, but then they ring the doorbell and they're waiting there for it, you know, to give it to you. And I'm like, I thought this was contact free. Uh, but I think the delivery driver was also a little bit confused. So there's certainly a, a learning period and a learning curve, but I think brands definitely can evaluate what they're offering, listen to their customers, survey their customers, ask them how they're doing, ask for that feedback, implement it, um, and then just really perfect these, these new services that you're offering. And like I said, lead the charge in terms of, you know, being innovative and responsible as a, as a brand. Okay. Yeah, and that sounds great. Yeah, it, you know, your your situation with the delivery driver coming and still knocking on the door, it's, it's maybe a little bit from a brand perspective to uh, push that message down to if they're using DoorDash, if they're using Postmates, if they're using Uber Eats, maybe that's uh, something that a brand could push down from a, um, you know, requirement is if it's going to be contactless and we need that, then you know, we want to make sure everybody's safe. So, um, and I've seen that happen too. Uh, I think Instacart does it really good where they just drop it off. But um, on top of that, you know, when I asked about, uh, you know, attributes, is there specific categories or even attributes within Google My Business? I'm sure we've talked about this on, you know, some of the past webinars um, that you see is, you know, highly viable for that contactless um, type of search. I'm not sure if that was applying to Google My Business listings or not. Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of the main sites and directories have rolled out additional attributes or at least fields where you can communicate some of these changes. Um, I've mentioned this before. I think, you know, Google, Bing, Yelp, Apple Maps, we've seen more changes and more implementations of new features and functionality in the last two months than I've seen, like, quite honestly, in the last two years. So they're certainly responding. Um, they, you know, are, are doing a lot to roll these out. A lot of them are rolling out quickly, so sometimes there's bugs and, you know, they're just trying to get something else out fast. But Google My Business in, you know, particular has a number of attributes, including, you know, no contact delivery, um, curbside pickup, mostly for dining and restaurant industries. Um, so if you are in one of those and it's important to your consumers to know that you do or don't offer one of those attributes, definitely publish it. And, you know, if you're not in one of those categories that has that attribute by default, you know, Google is rolling it out to, to new ones. They're exploring that. But in the meantime, you can always leverage like a COVID-19 post um, to communicate these. They're really high and really visible. We're actually seeing a ton of interaction with like the COVID-19 post option. They've been up for like a month or, or longer at this point. Um, so they're definitely another tool to use. Awesome. Yeah, and I would even say, uh, as we get to like the next topic of online presence, um, you know, Google My Business and listings kind of transfer over to uh, kind of your organic SEO and, and what you can do to provide a good UX, UI, uh, UI uh, to your consumers to provide the, the relevant information. So despite stores reopening in, you know, kind of some locations, some uh, customers are you know, understandably, you know, hesitant to do the in-store and shopping and high risk and all of that stuff that, that's going to happen over a period of time. So local pages and listings, what can we do there, right? Looking at, you know, is there schema markup? I've seen a lot of webmaster tools uh, that are coming out, features within Search Console um, that are looking at posts and, and specific items. So to really accommodate people, those who prefer to shop from home, um, you know, my question to Lauren is, you know, really, what have you seen? You know, is it how can you optimize their online presence for online and phone ordering, you know, outside of, you know, coming to the store? Right. So it's it for retail in particular, right, because I think that that's a really great example 
food, hospitality are right a separate entity in and of itself. Um, but from a retail perspective, we've really seen um, and we've been updating a lot of banners above the fold, ensuring that messages aren't staying stale, um, really customizing by location every day what is available at that store uh, and making sure that the uh, .com store locator pages and the listings within Google and if we can in other places as quickly as we can get it done on those two platforms, um, you know, make it more consistent. So based on how anybody is getting to your listing and your business, they have the same information across the board. So making sure that the curbside information for what the process is, right? And then having a CTA to shop for specific products that are available for curbside has been very prominent above the fold. Additionally, making certain things very visible, such as, you know, senior hours, pregnant, uh, pregnancy hours, um, immunocompromised by uh, population hours, things like that, and adding those um, new features on .com pages, and if available, which you know there was information that was shared today that there are secondary hours being rolled out within Google, right? Making sure that information information matches. Um, so at least on your front end, having that content be as consistent as possible and then kind of driving it back to the offline piece that we've discussed before, um, you know, making sure that messaging is as visible at the storefront as possible too, because believe it or not, there's still going to be people that show up and want to go in a store. It might be very small, but, um, you know, you can't assume that everybody's reading the news or knows what's going on. Um, so, you know, that is definitely helpful and then also driving people to make the phone call right a lot of the time some businesses uh, some retailers yeah so this is kind of like a two-pronged answer some retailers that do rely on call centers have had to pivot their strategy um, and really rely on the local businesses more versus routing through call centers to really help with additional ordering or information so that's been a really unique challenge for some businesses that they are struggling with um, and i it it's perfectly normal to be struggling with that at this point because it was completely unexpected. Staff isn't there, costs aren't there to support the needs. Um, but in general, making sure that your messaging is clear. If you can't change the information, what's, what has been great, uh, you know, for Bing, for example, it's, you know, call the store to confirm, right? Google has that call out too. So that's been really great, but also making very clear on pages, in listings, Google posts, wherever it is, everything the customer needs to do in order to get an order through or to get further information and kind of providing those CTAs and making it clear, you know, where they can order and how they can do it and driving them to the phone. Great. Yeah. And I've seen, um, particularly talking with a lot of brands and, and clients too, is, uh, you know, a lot more integrations are happening now um, as far as, you know, the buy online pickup in store, kind of elevated kind of that uh, industry on top of that is, you know, looking for a partner that can actually do um, online ordering, BOGO, whatever it is, um, right. or focus uh, within there. So I think that helps. And then from a, you know, schema markup, I think definitely there's been a lot of changes as far as events and, and things like that that have come up that really help with people. So, um, you know, Kind of on top of that is, you know, temporary closures and special hours, right? You know, Crystal, this is your world. Um, you know, obviously it, it plays into pages. We want to make sure that that is relevant within there uh, from the messaging that Lauren was talking about uh, on top of that. But, you know, we've kind of heard a little bit of mixed feedback and guidance from local SEOs and others over the past few months of, of how do you utilize you know, closing out of business, is it temporary closures versus special hours within there? This is a lot of topics that uh, Crystal, you and the team have talked about um, over the past couple of webinars. But for the brands we've worked with, you know, we've heard a lot of questions in regard to this. So especially as, you know, some begin to reopen, they're doing a rollout strategy, they're doing it particularly by brand or by uh, region. So for you, um, you know, what would be your best recommendation for how businesses should handle temporary closures and special hours, um, especially as they're expecting a new rollout date, right? It might not be tomorrow, it might be three months, but they have kind of a rollout plan. What does that look like? 
So my rule of thumb is to leverage temporary closures if you know you're going to be closed for two weeks or longer. Um, because that's something that, you know, you just set once, you now can set it via API. It does not impact your ranking. Google's confirmed that. Um, and it's pretty clear. Um, I think that's a, a, a good way to say, hey, customers, do not show up to my location for any reason. It's big and red. So, um, you know, especially if you are maybe a clinic or you're in healthcare, um, or maybe you're a hotel and you're housing COVID-19 patients or frontline workers and you do not want people to access your facility for whatever reason, definitely leverage um, temporary closures. And the good thing with temporary closures as you begin to reopen is you can use the opening date field, which historically has been for future openings, but it does work the same. So if you're temporary closed and you know we're opening, you know, June 3rd or July 1st or whatever the date is, you can add that to the opening date and it will display. So it gives consumers a heads up like, oh, I can come back to my favorite ice cream shop in a month. Um, you know, or I can begin ordering curbside pickup, you know, uh, in two weeks or whenever. Uh, so I do like that feature being able to leverage the opening date alongside temporary closures. But the downside is it doesn't operate together. It's not like the temporary closure goes away automatically whenever the opening date happens, which would be great. Um, you just have to maintain it on, you know, whether it's you or a partner, the day your location opens, you got to go remove that temporary closure either via API or manually. Um, alternatively, if you're leveraging special hours, even if they're longer for two weeks, because we've done that for a number of brands, um, you are able to set what date they expire and you default back to your primary hours, or maybe you have other, you know, temporary hours um, where you're going to be only open for limited hours or, you know, a few days a week. Um, but special hours do give you a little bit more flexibility and they are tied to a specific state. Um, so if we know, you know, something's opening next Wednesday, instead of marking a business as temporary closed and then remembering on Wednesday to schedule, you know, a reopening for that, we just would set special hours until Tuesday, knowing Wednesday it'll show open and there's that rolling seven day display on GMB. Um, and historically, special hours have been accepted by a number of other platforms as well. Um, Bing, Yelp, Apple Maps, all the, all the large players in the space. So it's easy to sync them across directories, whereas temporary closures have started rolling out recently um, for a lot of the other ones. So a lot of our brands have been leveraging special hours just due to um, the flexibility. That's great. Yeah, and I think that it, it definitely, you know, a lot of people don't know that. It's like, hey, do I set it and forget it and hopefully it works or does it expire? But I think knowing that there is, you know, some type of a rolling schedule that, that definitely gives uh, be applied to that uh, large or small definitely helps with everybody. So uh, thank you, Crystal. Um, and then reviews uh, or revenue generating strategies. What does that look like? Right. So um, definitely it's uh, re wreaked a havoc uh, this pandemic on everybody. I understand that. Um, but it's also impacted everybody worldwide. So it's not just uh, here locally, but at the local level, you know, most people have been forced to shut down. They've had to, you know, I've seen, you know, Sioux Plantation is closing all of their doors, you know, which is pretty massive. I love uh, a little soup uh, and salad buffet every once in a while, but uh, some would be sad about that. But um, what do we found to, you know, find other ways to improve their cash flow? You know, Google announced kind of businesses can access or include links in their GMB profiles for um, gift cards and donations and efforts to help with this um, because we're kind of all in this together. Um, Lauren, you know, kind of what other strategies have local businesses uh, or what can they take advantage to help generate income at this time I mean, from that perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of hit it with the, um, you know, starting off with the gift card piece, right, especially for small businesses, right, I live in a, just personal experience, I live in a smaller town, um, you know, Main Street USA kind of thing where there's, you know, the small hardware store and the local, you know, taco shop and for some reason we have a gem store. <laughs> and a tattoo parlor, right? But like two gas, like a gas station. And then it's like nothing for like the next like 10 miles. So um, it's 
what's been interesting is how local businesses are adapting to it. Um, and what we've seen is, you know, gift cards are definitely a huge opportunity for businesses to try and drum up and keep their doors open and afloat in the meantime to support the overhead costs to get curbside available, right? Take out things like that from a food perspective. Um, additionally, I mean, there are quite a few different ways to generate revenue, whether it's different models um, for subscriptions uh, or different offerings, right? Um, maybe they had a plan for a new app uh, and new features, right? And just making that a little bit more available, right? We've seen that with Disney Plus, for example, they're releasing videos up front, um, or you can do um, what would have been in movie theaters and you can rent that out, I think, through Amazon Prime as well. So those are just different elements, not saying that those businesses need money in particular, but nonetheless, um, just <laughs> saying like from a revenue generation, just kind of adapting to overcome local yoga studios, you know, they're offering lesser, uh, lesser cost to monthly, um, monthly memberships because it's all through Zoom, right? Um, and then they're also connecting with other local businesses or food shelters or anything of that sort and then donating back to a good cause a certain percentage. So I think that um, there's quite a few things that businesses can do. Uh, everybody's looking for a feel good story um, when it comes to that and making sure that people are still um, able to keep their job Right. I think that that's a hard reality that unfortunately all of us have been touched upon, whether it's people we know in any way, shape or form um, or businesses or whatever. Um, but I think that that's kind of a, a, a piece of it. Additionally, just trying to offer new features and opportunities um, that maybe weren't available before um, virtual classes of some sort, whether it's arts and crafts that they did in right in store at that point um, offering, you know, you buy a mask, you donate a mask, whatever it is, um, there are those types of options um, available. And then Bing and Google, right, are making it a little bit easier to, to let businesses be more upfront about their financial needs um, and help them generate revenue, whether it's a GoFundMe on Bing or now with Google offering, right, support links and things like that. Yeah, uh -huh. I've actually... Yeah, I... Go ahead. I was going to say there's um, a restaurant in San Diego. It's like a, a higher end restaurant in Little Italy called Kettner Exchange. And I've been getting a ton of like Facebook ads that they launched this car called the Buzz Buggy. And it's like they drive you around, you get a meal, you get drinks and it can sit like six people in it. But it was, I thought, kind of a clever way to adapt. It's not a, a full food truck. But they're delivering, I think, that missing experience that people have when they go into their restaurant, which I think for a lot of these restaurants that really banked on their experience, it's hard to adjust to a curbside pickup model and for people to um, that to resonate with people the same way, you know, dining in did. But they had a really, really, um, I think their their customer base really appreciated them um, and they were able to kind of, you know, share this feedback and they launched, you know, it's called the buzz buggy and it drives around San Diego for like two and a half hours. And you're just like, you know, enjoying it. It's with, you know, there's a, a decent amount of space inside. Um, so I thought that was actually interesting for, especially for a high end restaurant that you wouldn't think like now they're kind of doing like a beer and food tour. Um, but they're no, known for their drinks as well. It was a restaurant there. So I thought that was interesting. And I think us as digital marketers, just really helping our brands, um, you know, adapt to these, come up with these ideas, you know, advise them on how to roll out, you know, a trial for something like this, I think is, you know, incredibly helpful at this time. Yeah, just to yeah, kind of add, everything. Oops, sorry, I just want to quickly add to that. So the local distilleries by me actually switched to making hand sanitizer in the beginning when New York was short. Right. So I think just understanding what your business can offer and pivoting, right? It's not necessarily for profit seeking purposes, but nonetheless can still keep you afloat and moving forward. Um, you know, it, living in a very agricultural space, um, donating food to the shelters and food banks that require it more while you're still, you know, able to get your food, but if you can, you know, pay for it and things like that. But um, just to kind of hammer home businesses adapting, um, you know, things like that can be really unique and businesses really need to get creative to figure out um, the best approach. But right, the distillery making sanitizer is always, I, th I think that was like a big one that came up in the news in the beginning. So yeah, I think what it allows <clears throat> businesses to do is stay connected, um, which is, you know, just as important as is, 
you know, making a revenue at this point, you know, yep. um, if there's anything that they can offer um, that still meets their consumer, even though it's completely different than what they were doing before, um, it's, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I think everything's changed just to be, it, it's more like being a brand ambassador as far as, you know, connecting to your audience. I mean, I think strategically and, you know, with innovative approaches like using a distillery, okay, we can still make beer, we can make everything else, but we can also use a lot of the alcohol to actually make hand sanitizer, which, you know, now you're limited to like one per household, right? So those are things that, uh, you know, when we talk about local search is, is, you know, how do you promote that product? How do you look at that? How do you put that on your organic SEO pages as a example? And I mean, it might even be through e -com, right? Can't come in the store, but now we're pushing it to the e-commerce or online, buy online, pick up in store, curbside pickup, or just, you know, buy in general, um, that approach. So I definitely think, um, you know, overall, I think everybody's, you know, going in the right direction, but want to make sure that, you know, within this panel is, is we give the kind of right information as well. So, you know, we, I could go to the next topic, but it was really around, you know, being agile, being strategic, being innovative. Um, you know, what can you do for your consumer today? Because brand loyalty in all circumstances wins in the long run, right? It's the same way with reviews, right? Positive reviews definitely leads to more customers. Bad reviews lead to, you know, less customers. We get that. So what I kind of want to do is, is shift to uh, more of kind of uh, questions um, uh, from the audience just to see, you know, kind of we con kind of go on the home gambit as, as far as now. But, um, you know, one question that I had come up is, you know, as a quick service restaurant, we're looking to learn how to talk to uh, talk to our customers customers during COVID, what communications to, uh, to consumers want from us, best, best practices, like um, is it posts, is it uh, messages? So I can kind of leave that to, to both of you. You know, what have we seen with uh, QSR, especially so the, this time? The first thing I would do, especially since they're back, um, Google reviews are, are coming back. Um, they came back first for retailers and dining um, for net new reviews and now old reviews during that kind of blackout period are now publishing to your listing. So definitely start listening, listen to what they're saying, take a look at those new reviews, especially anything related to the pandemic, um, I think is the most important thing to do. I've seen so many like quick service restaurants and there, you know, our reviews complaining about how employees um, in the kitchen aren't wearing masks or the servers that are bringing the orders out aren't wearing gloves or whatever the case is. So I think that's the very first action you should do is before you determine what and how you communicate, listen to the feedback you've been getting. And then based on that, you know, choose your medium. Is it a Google post? Are you responding to those reviews? Are you going to do some social posts? Um, you know, I think you have to probably be a little bit unique if you choose to do email outreach because um, I think everyone was overloaded with it in the beginning about like a letter from the CEO about this pandemic. And um, I think now people are looking more for kind of actionable, actionable information or updates on business safety and policies as you plan to reopen from an email. Um, but I think, you know, if you can do anything on social, Twitter, I know Nextdoor has been huge um, since everyone's, you know, at home and they're, they're reaching out to their neighbors and those types of things. I think whether it's a business using Nextdoor um, or you're able to, you know, enable some of your, your, your loudest customers to post things on Nextdoor, um, I think is helpful. But absolutely the first thing is, is take a look at the feedback you've been getting from your, you know, customers that are still visiting you during this time frame. Um, and make sure you've addressed that in your communication. Yeah, and, and adding to that, um, it's being very explicit about your rules and regulations as a business, what you're willing to tolerate and not tolerate, right? For anybody that's a Reddit fan, <laughs> it always seems like there's an echo chamber of more videos of people trying to record going into supermarkets without mass saying their you know, rights are being infringed upon. Your, your private business, right? So at the end of the day, if you make your rules and regulations clear and people are trying to argue that, you also have to be firm in how you're also going to serve the customers that are loud in that kind of regard from that negative perspective. 
um, because that could lend itself to a review, right? And so how to filter out that piece and manage that and having as a business a protocol and process in place, I think is extremely important um, because everybody is, at, is on edge, right? So sometimes when we're on edge, we don't always respond to the way that we prefer to. So definitely keep that in mind and make it very explicit. If there's a billboard you have outside the restaurant, put that in a Google post, put that on your .com, put that anywhere and everywhere that you can possibly, pe that people can possibly visit you, email, social, the works, and make it clear that these are the rules and regulations. Here's how we are keeping things clean. Here's what we expect from our customers. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, putting your stake in the ground as a business and sticking to them. Yeah, so. I, I would add, I've actually seen, and to me, it's surprising about people complaining about the attitudes of employees when you go to like a restaurant or a store or a grocery store. And like, do you realize what these people have been doing? Like, yes, I know they may not be a healthcare worker, but they're just as stressed out as anyone right now. Um, and for some reason, you know, it's also because there's all of us, we're working at home, we're handling kids, we're doing all the, we're adjusting to this odd, you know, um, pandemic. And I think everyone's stressed out and everyone is less sensitive. So I've seen a lot more quick complaints about those things. But as you mentioned, I think there was like something that happened over a weekend at a grocery store, like one of those videos that went on Reddit and that business got flooded with positive reviews over the weekend. Like, um, you know, people were praising the way the employee was kind of like laughing about it or like kept a positive attitude about it. Or he was dancing when he yeah, was sanitizing. Yeah, like yeah I think it was like an Albertsons. I forget where, but yeah. yeah. But they That's just exactly got what I was referring to. Yeah, they yep. got flooded with positive reviews, which, you know, may eventually get removed if Google can identify, you know, they're not there, but Google's algorithm on reviews, that's something else. Um, but like that's, an, an, like you said, make sure your employees, your managers are all trained on how to handle these situations because they think they're just going to get more, especially if you're a grocery store, um, you know, and you're putting out a new policy about masks or you're publishing a new one. Um, or a business, is business reopening and now you're reopening with a new policy. Be, um, you know, upfront about that and, you know, share with your customers like, hey, we value this. This is for your safety. We will not tolerate this. Um, like you said, I think there's no issue putting your, your stake in the ground about, you know, where your stance is and your true customers are going to value that. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, and then just to touch on that, so we've kind of gone through like, you know, strategic, um, you know, how do we do this as a brand? Um, Lauren, I'm going to pass it over to you with your LaCroix and um, ask you about, uh, from a technical perspective, because this is kind of a, it, it's almost like a code freeze type of situation in, in some cases, right? Um, launching new products, launching new websites, launching new, you know, whatever that may be. Um, what would you say were kind of the, you know, top things that you would place into a local strategy from an organic SEO perspective? Technically, schema, whatever. During this time? Correct. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to admit clearly, <laughs> I did not think about like consolidating <laughs> that. I, I, you know, it based, I'm, I'm all about information right information overload the more information you have the better the opportunity is to make an informed decision so in terms of at least baseline for getting all of that information um you know i think from a technical perspective if you have the if you have the resources available it is it is important to audit your local pages for performance right definitely look at your overall performance because we are seeing gmb right and google traffic and, and map map views go down see where that traffic is going to and then from there optimize everything optimize those pages in particular and kind of always do the 80 20 rule right so 80 percent of your products are always going to care or 20 percent of your products are always going to carry 80 percent of your revenue so i think it's a great opportunity sorry i had a um calendar invite uh, pop up um so definitely take a look at you know what is driving in and maybe what has become a weaker link and re-optimize those pages whether it is ensuring they have information around covid whether it's shipping if it's an e-commerce direct um, if there's curbside available now, making sure the hours, right, all the information is there. 
um, seeing what the trends are, right? Google came out with a really great retail um, trends of what people are looking for from a you know purchasing perspective, sneeze guards and pool supplies and things like that. Um, but technical, yes, definitely look into your schema. Make sure you have your metadata set. It can be a quiet time for some people, so it doesn't hurt to do an audit. Reevaluate your keyword uh, research approach. See what's working. See what's not. See if there's things that are related to your brand that have changed. Whether you pull that from GSC, GMB. A bright, you know, or, or another enterprise keyword research type of tool. Um, and, you know, just kind of maybe also start cleaning up some bloat or, and or making sure that you're tracking things appropriately. Like I'm, I, I kind of sometimes see this as a little bit of a downtime when you don't have to just react to something. So it's a great way to take stock of what is working from your SEO strategy um, and trying to implement that in a twofold fashion, right? For COVID stuff and for non COVID stuff and just kind of then going from there. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. And I just wanted to, to add, um, we've seen a number of instances. I think Lauren, you mentioned this, like, look at your trends. Um, if they're not Google trends, look at, you know, the traffic that's coming to your website. Are you getting new traffic? Are you ranking for new terms? Um, we've seen this where we're seeing a lot of, you know, banks getting traffic for walk up or drive through or these types of things. So I think this is a, a great time to make sure you, you know, have your title tags optimized, especially if you offer those elements. Um, you know, it, it's a great time to say, let's you know, reposition some of these pages or some of this content. Yep. No, oh, that was awesome. Thank both of you. Um, I think we're wrapping up on time here, unless either of you have any other final comments you want to chat about or any topics, uh, let me know. Um, you know, we I, can. I think there was one more yeah. question um, we can answer um, that just okay. came in about reviews or photos um, with information about COVID-19. Um, the question is, will a business be able to flag them? What about photos with people that like have masks on in your business? So when it comes to Google, um, they have not changed their review policies. So if the review violates guidelines, um, the standard guidelines of reviews, um, then you are able to flag it and they'll review it. Um, I've seen both. I've seen a review about COVID that didn't violate guidelines and Google didn't remove it. And then I've seen ones about COVID did violate guidelines um, and they've removed it. So it's not automatic. They did, um, you know, analyze kind of the, the reviews that were left in blackout period and ran their, you know, kind of algorithm to to identify any you know spam or invalid reviews um, but it's kind of the same thing with you know images um, if they don't represent your business or you know they can be flagged standardly you can do that you can always do it and see what happens um, in terms of flagging the review or photo but the guidelines are still the same um, i know yelp is being a little bit stricter and they are allowing you to flag ones but it can't just be like a generic review about covid19 um, and how your business responded. They want to make sure someone's saying like, I didn't catch COVID-19 at your business or um, something like that. They're, they are allowing a little bit, you know, looser parameters mm -hmm. around what they will remove. But um, for Google, it's still kind of your standard guidelines. Perfect, thanks, Crystal. Um, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions that come up after this uh, webinar. Uh, obviously this is going to be recorded sent out, but if you needed to reach out to anybody on our team, uh, marketing at RioSEO.com uh, is a great resource. Also check out our COVID-19 uh, resource page as well, as well as other, you know, fun content that we're doing. Uh, but then if you think of, you know, white papers and case studies, uh, our website is, is usually a great place to go to. But so keep checking in. Um, I'd love to thank Crystal. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I wish I was on Lawrence Ranch, um, riding around. Should, on should I give it a shot? Should this. I just show everybody for quick glance? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's what I'm supposed uh, to do at this point. Here, quick glance, very everybody. Jealous. There we go. That's very, the outside. Yeah. yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. All right. Very I just jealous. see lots of houses yeah. next to me. No space here in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> There's more I'm, than I'm enough in, space to social distance yeah. by me. I'm in downstate New York, hour and 15 <laughs> outside the city. By all means, come on through. <laughs> I'm I'm stuck in the kitchen, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely want to thank both of you uh, and appreciate everybody who who joined during this call. 
um, and then we'll follow up with a, you know, follow up email and everything like that. So um, everybody stay safe, stay healthy. Um, stay safe. Stay with kids. It's a great, great <laughs> time. Uh, great time to optimize. It's also a great time to figure out all the fun things with your children. So <laughs> if you have that. So anyhow, uh, I really appreciate both of you and everybody that joined. So everybody have a great rest of your week. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you.